Thank you very much, Charlie, for that introduction. And thank you really to all of you for the invitation to come and present. It's really um, nice to have this opportunity to connect with you all given, yeah, it's been, it's been a while now. So I'm going to talk to you today about um, some work that I've been doing the last few years, distinguishing sympathizers, philanthropists, rusted on activists and radicals. And I want to talk in particular about using person-centered analyses in collective action research. And before you all groan and run away thinking this is going to be a methods heavy kind of exegesis, it won't. Um, and really what I want to talk to you about is how some of these methods that aren't yet commonly adopted in social psychological research in general can be used to shed light on very theoretically interesting questions that we have as social psychologists. So let me just check. Can you see my notes or my screen, like my talk? Sorry? Just your talk. Okay, you can just see the screen. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I'm going to start with a sort of almost very obvious point, which is that um, protest is everywhere. And even the, I guess, the limits occasioned by the pandemic haven't really stifled the um, resurgence of um, protest and sort of social mobilisation that we've been witnessing basically in every corner of the globe. So political scientist Erica Chenoweth uh, estimated that between 2010 and 2014, there was a large onset of mass civil movements and the entire decade of the, the 1990s. So really there has been this kind of explosive growth of protest and alongside that, there's also been a really sort of explosive growth of research on these questions. Uh, so, and much of that research, including my own, has focused on addressing what I've kind of simplified here, grossly simplified, is two kind of big questions is in this literature. When is, one is, well, why do some people act whilst others don't? So there's work talking about, for instance, difference between activists or protesters versus sympathisers bystanders or people who are inert. And then a second kind of category of work um, in this space has really been around, well, why do some people adopt more radical, illegal, violent tactics, whereas other people adopt sort of peaceful, more conventional tactics? And I think those are the two kind of big questions that have really structured a lot of scholarly effort in this domain. I'm going to start by making, though, quite an obvious kind of claim about these two questions. And, and that is that sort of implicit and explicit in these questions is people. Um, and a lot of the work focuses on understanding the, the kind of the motivations, the attributes, the emotions that shape people who act versus those who don't. And um, the, yeah, the emotions, attributes, identities that people have that shape, again, engagement in uh, more radical or illegal um, forms of social action. Um, so, you know, these are characteristics that um, are, are contained within people in some ways. The other um, kind of claim I want to make about what a lot of this literature is either explicitly or implicitly trying to understand is also this kind of um, implicit focus on subgroups of people. So we distinguish between, potentially we distinguish between activists and protesters from sympathisers and bystanders. We also distinguish between activists, um, activists and radicals. Um, and then we can also distinguish between radicals and terrorists, for instance, um, the former being a group of people who are potentially prepared to use more militant tactics, illegal and or violent tactics, but terrorists are specifically different in as much as they're prepared to use violence against um, civilian targets. So we've got all these kind of layers of theoretical um, kind of nuance around people who act, people who don't. Um, often these address kind of subgroup differences. Um, and you can see this also in some of the, the kind of typologies that we've developed to try and explain some of these things. So the one on the left uh, is work done by Stephen Wright in uh, 2009, where he distinguishes again between those who take action, those who don't, the form of that action, and then whether or not it is um, what he's, he's calling here contentious versus non-contentious action. And then on the right, we've got the, the recent uh, Macaulay and Moskalenko two pyramids model of um, radicalization in which they distinguish between radicalization of opinion, radicalization of action. I guess my point at, uh, here for our purposes today is that these are then theories that we have about subgroups of people who act and subgroups of people who act in different ways to other subgroups of people. And 
My concern is, and really this is my kind of provocative claim of the day that you can uh, take issue with potentially if you like, is that though, despite the fact that most of our theories are about people and attributes of people that often kind of coexist within uh, people in quite complex ways, most of our theories use variable centered techniques to test theories that are either implicitly or explicitly about subgroups of people. So potentially we're not necessarily accessing the most relevant set of methodologies to, to test and assess some of our claims. Um, I, I realise that I guess within um, with I guess within the audience there may be a, a variation in the degree to which people are um, familiar with the distinction between what are called variable centred approaches and um, person centred approaches. So I hope you won't find this patronising for those of you that do know a lot about these approaches. But I'm just going to give you a quick crash course now, and this is I swear the only methodologically dense, boring -y bit, but it's just important to understand in terms of understanding what the critique is and how it aligns with our theory and methods. So the distinction between person-centred approaches and variable-centred approaches, it really boils down to, I guess, a fit between what your theoretical questions are and then how you test those within the methods and the statistical approaches that we adopt. So variable centered approaches are obviously the dominant approach within social sciences, including social psychology, and they explain relationships between variables of interest. So for example, these kinds of uh, approaches would help us to explain the relationship between social identification, being committed to groups, and intention to engage in collective action. Um, and they're therefore appropriate for investigating questions and hypotheses about how one of those variables affects the other variables. So what is the relationship between identification and intention to engage in collective action? And how can we capture the variation between those two variables? And statistically, then when you maybe look at the, the overlap, you correlate them, you regress them, you run a structural equation model, you're, in, you're describing the entire sample together. So it's a very parsimonious way of understanding variation that exists between variables within a sample. Um, but it is not necessarily adequately addressed to assess, um, I guess, subgroup differences within that sample overall. So, um, and in particular, I guess, differences in the ways that some people can differ on multiple dimensions in ways that descri describe multiple subgroups um, I'll explain a bit more about what I mean that in a second. So person centred approaches, on the other hand, are an emerging approach within the social sciences um, and I guess have been kind of more broadly taken up in clinical psychology, I think, developmental psychology, organisational psychology um, and certainly medical sciences. And they seek to identify the existing or emergent subpopulations within a broader sample. And um, if this is still confusing to you, don't worry, because much of what I'm going to be talking about today will kind of step through um, our application of some of these approaches. Importantly, these approaches are really appropriate where the goal is to categorise a sample into subpopulations based on a chosen set of variables. And then those subpopulations can be explored using predictors or outcomes um, so unlike a variable centred approach where you kind of model the parameters in the variables um, within the whole sample overall, what you actually statistically do with this kind of approach is that you give different subgroups within that sample, different parameters, and then you use variables to explain those different parameters. So it loses out on the parsimony, but it kind of gains in some of the specificity. And as I said before, it's not really a matter of which approach is better. There is no inherently better approach. It's just really seeing them as complementary, but also tailoring the statistical approach that you adopt to the, the method, um, uh, or to the theory and the, the questions that you're asking. So with that crash course in mind, I'm gonna take you through three propositions today and, and some work that I've been doing in the last few years, um, testing these propositions and really kind of trying to apply some of these methods to shed light on things that maybe variable centered approaches are even not as well equipped to help us answer. So the first proposition is that these methods can help us to identify and distinguish the underlying subgroups in terms of a, a whole kind of a community or in this case, a sample who might be acting and then trying to say, well, what are the people who are acting in different ways? So I'll talk about the distinction between those who give and those who do in the context of the movement to end global poverty. 
the distinction between sympathisers, activists and radicals in the context of the movement to promote, promote justice for animals that exist in factory farms. The second proposition draws on work that I've been doing with Winifred um, in particular, looking at um, how the methods can really help us to identify volatility in collective action and identify heterogeneity, schism in a broader movement after failure. And then the third proposition is that the methods can help us to identify and explain distinct trajectories of action over time. And so I'll talk there about um, a large sort of longitudinal study that I've been working on in the context of the movement to end global poverty and how these kinds of methods can help us to understand those who increase, stay the course, walk away. So that's where we're going to go today. And I'm going to move quite quickly. So I hope that um, you'll kind of play along. I guess the general approach that I'll adopt across those three prepositions and the work that I'll talk about uh, in the context of the propositions is to say, well, okay, adopting these personal person-centered approaches, what are the meaningful subgroups that together comprise the broader population? So I'll use uh, what are called latent profile analyses and in the longitudinal data growth mixture models to identify where there are subgroups in the data. And these allow you to basically empirically test for the presence of subgroups. So is everyone in this data set the same in a, in a kind of a latent sense or are there subgroups within these data? And if so, how many are there? What is the nature of those subgroups? And then if you've found that you can identify some of those subgroups, then the group membership becomes a latent unobserved categorical variable that you can then model and explain using other predictors. So that's the kind of second step then is, well, what differentiates membership of the subgroups? So say we can identify sympathizers from activists, well, then we can use theoretical insights derived from the literature on the social psychology of collective action to look at what explains membership of one profile or trajectory over another. And in the longitudinal research that I'll be talking about um, last, it's a similar kind of thing where mixture models, they're called mixture models is the kind of generic term, allow you to model the effects of the predictor and outcome variables on the latent profiles or latent trajectories. So that's the general approach I'm kind of going to adopt. Are there subgroups? What are they? And if there are subgroups, well, how would we theorize that they're different across these different domains? Um, and as I said earlier, um, I've been kind of fortunate to have some wonderful collaborators on this work. So Craig McGarty, Winifred Lewis, Morgana Lizio Wilson, uh, Simon Bury and Michael Wenzel have all collaborated in uh, different bits and pieces of this work. And um, we've been funded by the ARC and some uh, funding from the Animal Advocacy Research Fund as well. So starting with that first proposition then that the methods really, and this kind of segues, I guess, neatly on from the kinds of points I opened with here, which is that we can understand the people and the subgroups of people who are acting in qualitatively different ways using these methods. Um, and our, I guess what actually got me interested in the application of these kinds of methods was um, as part of my DECA research when I was really interested in this question of the different ways that people can act um, to respond to the inequality and disadvantage experienced by people in developing countries. And I was struck that there were two kind of really quite different approaches to how you could tackle um, global poverty in this context. One, um, which was the, I guess, the approach that is probably most commonly seen and understood and discussed um, in most Western societies is to see this as an issue of collective giving. So people um, we'll talk about donating a proportion of their income. Maybe we sign up to World Vision um, and other NGOs to uh, give money monthly or whatever it is to support um, recovery for people in developing countries. There is a second kind of more socio-political side to this though, which is that you can engage in collective action. And this was a, a really quite prominent approach in the mid 2000s when uh, the Make Poverty History Movement um, kind of experienced a brief, all too brief um, moment of global prominence. Um, and these people were engaging in collective action because they recognized that there were systematic elements to the maintenance of that kind of global inequality. So these people did the kinds of things that we talk about in collective action research. They wanted to pressure the government. They were rallying, marching, petitioning. And these are two quite different behaviors. So the, the idea here is that, well, people can share the same social change goals but arrive at very different conclusions about the most effective means of achieving that change. 
And I guess what's interesting for us as social psychologists is to say, well, how are these different subgroups understanding that context so differently potentially? Or are they understanding the context differently? And if they are, then, then how are they understanding that context differently? And as I said, when I started to look at the literature, there really did seem to be this kind of schism within the literature on the, and I know that um, work that Cass has been doing um, as part of her PhD is sort of confronted this schism as well, that on the one hand, you've got this literature looking at kind of giving and supporting and benevolence and, and the, the kind of the literature on charity and philanthropy and kind of help. And then on the other hand, you've got the, the literature that I'd kind of been playing around in as well, which was more about this kind of um, socio-political activism um, in terms of changing the world. So acting, challenging, themes of social justice, activism and collective action. And, and those two things kind of can sit alongside one another, um, but really aren't um, well integrated at present. So some of the, the, I guess, the theoretical work that we sought to do at the time really sort of tried to bring some of these two things into a comparative focus. And so I kind of looked at uh, the literature and I thought, well, if there are these two kind of different subgroups of people who are engaging, engaging in what we termed benevolent support, so kind of charitable support versus this very socio-political activist support, what kinds of things differentiate those two groups and actually links really quite nicely on from some of the points Brian was making a minute ago, you know, it's things around how people attribute the situation in the first place. So who is responsible for this system? Um, are the victims themselves responsible? Do I just feel sorry for you or am I angry about a system that maintains your disadvantage in a way that is, you know, quite hard to um, to be addressed without that systematic structural change. And again, people can have very different social change beliefs about um, potentially the uh, capacity of mass generosity. So if we all donate effective um, to the sort of mass capacity, then maybe we can um, address this disadvantage um, versus well, really actually we need to target the unfair system um, that maintains the disadvantage in order to bring about change on these issues. So we set about to test some of these ideas using um, the kind of person-centred approaches that I've just talked about. So we had 2,228 members of anti-poverty organisations in the first wave of this research, and we asked them how often they donate, how much they donate, but we also asked how often they do things like petition, lobby MPs, attend rallies, post in social media about the issue of global poverty. And they completed measures of essentially attributions for blame about global poverty. So whether or not nature was to blame, corruption was to blame. And one of the key, um, key attributions that I was interested in there was about, I guess, the culpability of developed countries as well in terms of the maintenance of um, global poverty. We asked about the emotions and whether or not people felt outraged versus sympathetic, social change beliefs and social identification as a supporter. So in terms of the latent profile analysis, I used the actions that people say that they take. And um, when you uh, do these methods, you're essentially not modeling one action separate to others. You smoosh across all of them and they're called mixture models. Um, and you smoosh across all of the actions and then you look at what the meaningful subgroups are in terms of people, how people are acting across the combination of those actions. So we'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. And then we used these um, variables as predictors of the profiles. Um, and what we found is, I haven't given you a whole lot of technical detail, but I can talk more about that if you're interested. But what we found was that essentially empirically and theoretically a two profile solution emerged from the latent profile analysis that really mapped nicely onto the kinds of distinctions that I was talking about a moment ago. So remember this sample that we sampled from was an entirely engaged sample. So there were no sort of disengaged sympathizers or whatever in the sample. And we kind of didn't expect there to be because we had sampled primarily through the mailing lists of non-poverty um, anti-poverty NGOs, basically. So we found this benevolent supporter group who were 90% of the sample and they engaged in quite high levels of charitable giving, but basically rarely if, any did, if ever did any of the other forms of action. 
And then we found this small um, part of the, the sample that were what we termed our activist supporters. So they actually engage in quite high levels of charitable giving as well, which kind of goes to my point that often when people engage in these actions, they're not just doing one thing in a ways that would align nicely with a variable centered approach. People are complex and do lots of different things all at the same time. Um, and they engage though in a raft of sort of socio-political actions. So attending rallies, signing petitions, writing letters. And they were doing these things quite frequently as well, which made them, I guess, empirically and theoretically quite different to the other subgroup. Then when we look at what distinguished um, the two different groups, so um, the benevolent supporters were uniquely distinguished by um, sort of a blame for nature, corruption and war for the circumstances of people in developing countries. Activist supporters on average also endorse those explanations, but were uniquely characterised or explain, uh, explained by these attributions around international exploitation. So the idea that unfair aid, trade agreements, debt, um, debt reduction, um, things also contribute and there is this kind of global systematic aspect um, which is I guess again aligned with that kind of socio-political um, kind of mindset of this subgroup. Again consistent with those kinds of patterns of attribution or explanation, um, sympathy predicted benevolent supporters whereas outrage predicted activist supporters had quite different social change beliefs around how we can and should bring about change. So um, the benevolent supporters were defined by this belief that we can sort of act to address this situation through taking personal change actions versus the need to challenge the structures themselves. Both groups were predicted, um, well, no, activist supporters were more strongly socially identified, but benevolent supporters were still identified in, in mean level terms. And I guess really what this showed for our purposes is that there were subgroup differences in the way that people perceive, respond to and act to address the situation in, in ways that are kind of theoretically interesting um, and relevant. We adopted a similar kind of approach in um, some subsequent work that we did in which we were interested in understanding the variation of ways that people can respond to the systematic abuses of non-human animals. So this was work that was funded by the animal advocacy um, group so here we were really particularly interested in how people can make changes to one's own pattern of consumption. So um, vegetarians and vegans are people who often make kind of changes to their own um, lifestyle kind of patterns of consumption to support non-human animals. Um, you can take political actions and say, well, look, you know, it's it should not be legal um, to keep chickens cooped up in battery farms and you can lobby for changes through a kind of a, a political legislative process and we could think of these people as activists. And then we often hear about um, these kind of radicals, these animal welfare radicals who engage in illicit investigation, direct rescue and, and um, members of these groups will break into um, factory farms and rescue and rehome chickens and things like that. So again, there's literatures on each of these different forms of action, but actually a lot of, we know that a lot of the people who are, might be termed um, radicals are also vegan. Um, so people don't just do one thing. Real people don't just do one of these things. They'll do lots of these things. And if that's the case, then it makes sense to look at the subgroups of people who are acting in qualitatively different ways. So we recruited uh, 578 um, respondents through Mechanical Turk, um, and we asked them the kinds of actions, kind of basically um, segueing on from what I was just talking about a moment ago, we asked them a raft of things, um, that, that things that they were doing to try and um, object to the systematic abuse of animals in factory farms. So personal actions around reducing or removing meat from diet, political actions around signing rallies, um, signing petitions and attending rallies, and radical actions around sort of investigating cruelty, break and enter, sit-ins, that kind of stuff. And then, and those were the indicators again that we used in the latent profile analysis. And then we had a whole bunch of, I guess, theoretically derived um, markers or things that we really thought would differentiate based on our kind of theorising and the theorising in the social psychological literature on collective action around why people would engage in these different forms of action. 
Um, so we looked at the role of particular identities that people can have, um, how they understand and appraise the intergroup context in ways that lead them to see um, particular forms of action as more necessarily and legitimate than other forms of action. And again, their social change beliefs. So again, we did a latent profile analysis and we found a three profile solution emerged um, here. So because we had a non-activist sample in this um, study, we found a group of people who were the majority of the sample, perhaps unsurprisingly, who we termed the ambivalent omnivores. So these were people who occasionally limited their own consumption of meat and animal products, were moved to purchase humane products sometimes and discuss the family, um, discuss the topic, but were otherwise inactive. So these are people that are kind of aware and maybe probably feel um, a bit uh, implicated, but don't otherwise act on um, to, to bring about any other kind of concerted changes. There was a second group who comprised 23% of the sample that we termed the lifestyle choice activists and the lifestyle choice actually realized sounds a little bit derisive, um, not intended to, but really these are people who are limiting their own personal patterns of consumption of meat and animal products um, really quite frequently, but also reported doing some political things around signing petitions, sharing inf information through social media and donating. And then there was a third group, and I was actually quite excited to find that we could identify this group um, that were termed the, the vegetarian radicals. And so they often limited um, meat consumption and animal products. They donated to campaigns, um, including campaigns that were specifically um, law breaking. They signed petitions, but also reported attending sit-ins, participate participating in rescues, investigations to reveal cruelty. So this was a method that, as I said, I felt excited about in terms of being able to identify an otherwise small, but quite difficult to access and theoretically interesting kind of subgroup. And then when we looked at what explains those different subgroups, um, again, we found that um, there was this, I guess, kind of quite theoretically explicable pattern of predictors that explained people who membered, who were members of one kind of subgroup or profile relative to the other profiles. So being a lifestyle choice activist was predicted by identification as a vegetarian, as well as identification as a supporter of animals. Uh, being a member of the vegetarian radical profile was predicted, um, uniquely predicted by identification as a vegan and also identification as a supporter of animals. I had initially actually labeled the vegetarian radicals profile vegan radicals, um, but we couldn't get that through peer review because they didn't always, um, in terms of the frequency of the behaviors, they didn't always limit those behaviors. Um, so yes, so anyway, I think, I. I felt I still feel actually that's a bit of a counterintuitive finding, but um, but anyway, so I guess what's reassuring here is that the latent statistical subgroups in that sense are reassuringly underpinned by the relevant group memberships that people um, reported subjective group memberships. Um, those different subgroups also had quite different, but again, theoretically explicable understandings of the intergroup context. Um, so uh, the lifestyle choice activists were distinguished by, by what um, Simone and Klandermans would talk about as these kind of markers of a, a more overtly politicised um, kind of context, a bit like what I was just talking about a moment ago in the poverty context. So the awareness that you share the position with other people um, is part of their kind of model of how people become political agents. Um, and then the need to convince third parties, and I guess in this context, you know, we need to convince other people to stop participating in the abuse of animals by altering their own kind of patterns of consumption and things like that. So these um, markers kind of uniquely distinguished that profile relative to the two other profiles. And then the vegetarian radicals were who, who were our part of um, our sample, who were the only ones that really reported engaging in any of the more kind of illegal um, forms of action. I guess were indicated or predicted by that that more radicalized um, belief in the justification of extreme measures. So really, you know, these measures are justified because it's the only way we can bring about change on this issue. Oh, sorry. And finally, the different subgroups were also explained by I guess different sets of beliefs about whether we can 
and how we should bring about social change on this issue. So again, the lifestyle choice activists were um, predicted by a kind of a generalized group efficacy. So we actually can fix this situation if we act together. But that same generalized group efficacy negatively predicted vegetarian radicalism. Um, and this is a finding um, that is sort of a re reasonably consistent finding within the collective action literature that a lack of efficacy can predict um, engagement in more radical forms of action. And then the form of, I guess, the social change belief there that predicted vegetarian radicals again was that, you know, really it is necessary to engage in these more um, radical, potentially illegal forms of action to bring about change on this issue. And, and this is the most effective way to bring about and change on this issue and, and I guess protect animals. So that was proposition one, um, and I'm blasting through things. So again, I hope you'll just um, keep your questions and I'm happy to answer more questions about those. The second proposition though, really stems from work that Winifred and colleagues and I have been doing in the context of volatility in collective action. Um, and the, the kind of underpinning insight here is that collective action for social change is volatile. Um, collective action is underpinned by identities. Identities are fluid, they are contested and they are changeable in, in, con in context essentially. So identities will change in response to the social context as well. Um, and if that's the case, then can we use these kinds of methods to identify what the fault lines of action are and how they can potentially change over time? Um, so I guess in keeping with this uh, emphasis on changes in the, the kind of context and how that can change movement dynamics. Um, we developed, or Winifred and um, I and colleagues developed uh, the DIME model of collective action outcomes, which I won't um, go into lots of detail about. I'm sure with Winifred in the E room, you're um, all very familiar with this model. But the key idea here is that when a movement is experiencing failure, the effects on a broader kind of movement or a broader population are likely to be very heterogeneous. So um, some people will um, kind of give up. They'll go away because, um, you know, the movement is not getting anywhere. So this will just leave some people to give up, disidentify and exit the movement. Other people, though, when your movement is failing or struggling to achieve the desired change that you're kind of seeking, will want to do more of the same faster, harder. So they'll have this kind of energization pathway whereby they'll want to do, yeah, want to do essentially the same kinds of things that the movement had been doing, but do more of it with greater energy. And then others still may want to adapt new tactics altogether. And that's the innovation pathway within the DIME model. And in particular, I guess, where conventional tactics are, are seen to be failing, then these subgroups of people may want to use more radical forms of um, methods. Um, and this is in line with work from the political violence literature suggesting that really um, political violence can emerge as a strategic kind of um, response to the perceived intergroup environment. But the broader picture here then is, you know, if these effects are likely to occur across the movement um, for some groups of people, but not others, and of course, people who are disidentifying and not going to be the ones saying, well, we need to do more, faster, harder, then we really need methods that can identify how those different subgroups of people are responding in similar ways, but different to other subgroups of people. And again, this implicates person-centered methods. So we adopted these kinds of methods in some work that we did um, testing this DIME model in the context of the 2017 um, Australian Marriage Equality Postal Survey. And this was work um, that led now by Morgana Lizio Wilson um, and has just come out recently in Psych Science. So we um, took three measurement points. Um, we took a measurement point uh, roughly, I think it's four weeks um, before the announcement like when we're actually, it was when we were doing the votes. Then we took a time two measurement of supporters and opponents of marriage equality on the day that the announcement was made. And then we took an eight week, uh, a measurement eight weeks after the announcement of the opponents only. So the people that had experienced failure, we went back to them at time three, but not the supporters. So here, the supporters of marriage equality had obviously experienced a campaign success, whereas the opponents had experienced a campaign failure. 
And again, it's um, kind of linking also with work that Sani and Raisha have done around kind of schism within movements. We wanted to use these methods to say, well, how cohesive? What are the subgroups? How cohesive is the movement? Um, and this is what the, the groups looked like um, before the announcement. So on the left, you've got the supporters. On the right, you've got the opponents of marriage equality. And you can see that actually the two kind of groups, the, the pro and the anti, actually look very similar. So there's a group of committed activists, there's a group of moderate supporters, but, but those are both pretty similar for, for both sides, I guess, of the debate before the announcement. So then the question for us is what happens after the announcement? Well, here you saw really quite dramatic differences in terms of how the the two groups manifested after the announcement. So on the left, we've got the supporters. So a group that had sort of experienced a win for their movement, because obviously marriage equality was passed, uh, was supported. And this group basically became one big happy movement, one big happy group. So we actually found a two profile solution, but you can see that that second um, profile, the committed, the committed disidents, these are people who are highly disidentified, but also still highly moralizing and low in energy. Um, they're a really tiny fraction of that sample and 97% of people were basically the same. On the right though, we've got this kind of fracturing and the splintering of the movement into the four different profiles around people who just wanted to stay the course in terms of um, continuing to do more things, people who wanted to innovate, innovate people who are just moderate across the board, and then people that we've called resigned acceptors. So basically who are low to moderate in dis disidentification, still continue to see this as a really morally important issue, but low in innovation, no in, low in energization. So they're not gonna do anything, but they still think it's a moral issue. And you really saw this kind of fracturing therefore after the, the failure. And again, I guess linking with some of the points that we've been talking about, these two profiles then predicted kind of theoretically interesting kind of subsequent forms of action in response to that changing intergroup context. So immediately after the announcement, the stay the course profile and the innovator profile predicted intention to engage in conventional and radical action, as well as justification of more extreme measures. And eight weeks later, though, only the innovator profile had really continued, reported that they had continued to engage in action and that they continued to see, I guess, the, you know, extreme measures as the only way in terms of bringing about change on, on this issue uh, in line with their desired social changes. So moving on to the third proposition, then the third and final proposition is that these methods can also help us to identify and explain traje distinct tra trajectories of action over time. Um, and so this really kind of moves us from a more static um, kind of study of collective action that I've been talking about so far into a longitudinal um, kind of more time focused or time interested um, study of, of change. And again, I think this is really important because of course, social change takes time. So any given kind of desired social change takes concerted effort over days, weeks, months, years, decades. Um, and we really therefore need to have a complete understanding or a more complete understanding of how people maintain their commitment over time. But again, linking back to the kind of dime um, ideas we were talking about, about a moment ago, some people will maintain their interest and commitment over long periods of time. Some people burn out and walk away. Um, some people can change in ways that are non-linear. So again, and we see a lot of this, I think now with social media, we see huge kind of spikes, dramatic spikes of engagement and then you know it falls away and those would be non-linear changes. And these kinds of methods can help us to identify those subgroups of people who are changing in those ways. And again, use theories to predict why they are doing so. So that is what we did here. Um, we looked at trajectories of collective action. Um, and here we took, again, it was the same kind of sample that I talked about um, before with the global poverty work, um, but these were a group of longitudinal participants who participated every year for five years. And again, we asked them how often they donate, how much they petition, lobby MPs, do those political things. And um, we also asked them uh, about their emotions 
outrage, sympathy, guilt and hope, um, their efficacy beliefs about the capacity of the group to bring about change and social identification as a supporter of poverty reduction. So again, these actions over five years were what we used to look at and model trajectories of action. And these were the items that we used to predict um, those trajectories. Um, and I guess what I, I wanted to draw out here in a theoretical sense anyway, was that we're really, or I was really particularly interested in the role of emotions in how they would predict people who stay the course people who drop out, um, people who have some quadratic changes. Um, and we, I kind of developed, we developed this rationale that emotions actually might play an important role in distinguishing different temporal sequences of action, partly because they contain different time reference. So as well as being an emotion that diagnoses, um, I guess, a socio-political anger and outrage about a state of affairs, Outrage is also a present focus emotion in that it focuses on how things are, the current state of affairs and sympathy is the same. Guilt is a past focus emotion. So it's about kind of past misdeeds and hope, I guess we're particularly interested in as a sustaining future emotion because hope is an emotion that should be resilient to setbacks and failure. And it may be able to carry people through, um, yeah, long kind of periods of inertia. So we took those items and I ran some growth mixture models. I found not the world's most exciting trajectories of collective action, I'm going to say, and I can talk a little bit uh, if there's time about why that is, but we found essentially an activist supporter group who were only 7% of the sample and they started very high. So if four is basically often doing actions on this scale, they started high and then stayed relatively high, but nevertheless had a weak negative slope. So basically over the five years that I ran this study, the federal government, in, uh, well, federal governments of multiple political persuasions increasingly downgraded Australia's commitment to global poverty reduction. And you can see that that has sort of potentially affected this group of activist supporters. So they've got this kind of weak uh, negative slope, but they nevertheless still highly engage. And then you've got the other group that we've termed benevolent supporters. So they're doing lower level stuff, but they've continued to do it over long periods of time as well and actually have a weak but positive slope. So they've potentially upped their game a bit in relation to the changes in the context. And again, so then the question is, well, what predicts these two groups? And, and kind of linking with the work that I talked about before, Sympathy was a predictor of being in that benevolent support trajectory. Outrage and hope were predictors of um, that activist trajectory. And I really like this finding because it suggests that combinations of emotions may play an important role in how people sustain action over time. So outrage is about being angry in the present, but hope is about action for the future and change for the future. And those two things might be very complementary uh, in terms of how people maintain commitment over long periods of time. Guilt and group efficacy actually didn't predict either profile. They essentially didn't distinguish between these groups. Okay, so that just about brings me to the end of my three propositions. And I know I'm also just about out of time. So I hope I've convinced you the methods help us to identify and distinguish um, different subgroups they help us to understand volatility in collective action and identify and explain distinct trajectories of change of action over time. More broadly though, I think that efforts to kind of broadly theorize social change rest on identifying the fault lines of group action, but these are not always directly observable. Um, and so often therefore, we really need to use these methods a bit more often than we maybe are because we can't always observe um, the, the kinds of things that we're interested in understanding from one big sample using variable centered approaches. And you can see this kind of debate, I guess, about the fault lines in lots of different ways. So, you know, there's a debate about whether or not it, the collective is de defined by being advantaged or disadvantaged or whether it's about a group's goal. Uh, with this sort of more discussion, including work done by Brian and his colleagues about the need to distinguish those who support and oppose bystanders, third parties, and we need to convert sympathisers into the movement. We can't get a handle on any of that if you don't have a sense of what the subgroupings are. 
And I mentioned before in the context of the radicals, it's actually quite difficult to find um, samples of radicals who want to participate in our research. But again, the animal um, work suggests that we can identify some of those people using these methods and then we can study them. So that is, I think, fruitful. Uh, theoretically, I think there is an increasing emphasis in our theories on this topic around complexity. So really looking beyond individual variables, how clusters of interrelated emotions, motives and beliefs define some groups of people relative to others, and how those clusters change over time in response to changes in the social context. And again, some of the work Winifred and um, colleagues and I have been doing kind of try to theorise some of that as well, but we're going to need more complex methodological approaches. And I want to end with this really, I think it is an intensely theor um, practical um, set of methodological approaches as well. So if you were to talk about this in marketing terms, you would say this is market segmentation. If you want to know and understand people, you need to know what the subgroups are, how they're different, how you can change the minds of some people in ways that might be different to others. And this um, set of approaches are yeah, really I I ideal for helping us do um, some of those, some of that work. So nothing so practical as a good theory and a good method. And on that note, thank you for your time. <laughs>